Hello and welcome to the Broadway Q&A presented by Playbill and The Growing Studio. I'm Danny George. Every Monday and Wednesday, I sit down with different directors, choreographers, composers, lyricists, music directors, and more. Every Friday, I chat with America's musical theater colleges uh, and acting colleges. Uh, if you are not following us, please do so on Instagram at Playbill and at The Growing Studio for the latest information on all of our upcoming streams. I am so excited today uh, to interview uh, a director choreographer who is incredibly impactful, who is so brilliant, whose work you must know. That's Kathleen Marshall. Kathleen, are you here? I am, hi, hi Danny. How are you? Good, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Where are you quarantining? I am in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, oh my goodness, so close. Yeah, I, my husband and I, I mean, just by coincidence, last July, we moved from Manhattan, living on the Upper West Side for many, many, many years, to Montclair, New Jersey with our 10-year-old twins, just turned 10 in May. So I wow. uh, feel very fortunate to sort of be in a small town at this time. Wow, you, that's so that's amazing. You got out before. I mean, your timing is, is pretty great. <laughs> you know. Yeah, nice. We've got a, a you know a house and a yard and a pool, which is really good, and yeah. a dog, which is really yeah. good. my uh, my husband and I uh, moved to uh, Stamford, Connecticut, and now we're wow. in because we're expecting in November. Wow! Um, so oh, congratulations! We were, thank you, thanks. So we right. were ready for a lot that. Of conversation, you and me talking about. Yeah, that. I have a ton of questions. I'm sure I'll, I'll send you an email. <laughs> Um, so we have a bunch of questions from viewers today. If you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and comment and let us know what questions you'd like to ask Kathleen. We'll be bringing a couple of you on to ask Kathleen yourself. Um, so I want to uh, start with just five or six rapid fire questions, if that's okay. Sure. Where were you born? Madison, Wisconsin. Favorite fruit? Apples. Favorite vegetable? Oh, Brussels sprouts. First musical you ever saw? Wow. Okay. First Broadway musical I ever saw was Angela Lansbury and Gypsy. First musical, hard to say. I do remember we saw Oklahoma at Civic Light Opera in Pittsburgh. Uh, first musical you fell in love with? Oh boy. Uh, West Side Story. Celebrity dream crush. <laughs> uh, well, luckily I got to meet him and work with him, Hugh Jackman. <laughs> oh, what a dream. Uh, Matthew Broderick or Matthew Broderick? Oh my gosh, both at the same time. He's the best. <laughs> Favorite vacation spot? Uh, Cape Cod. Ice cream flavor? Chocolate. Favorite music Chocolate style? Chocolate is not dessert. That's my motto. Yeah. Mine too. <laughs> Favorite music style? Music style. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I'm like a I'm like an American songbook girl. Give me, give me you know, anything from the 40s, 50s. Yeah, sung by Ella Fitzgerald, and I'm in. <laughs> Show that you have not worked on that you are dying to get your hands into. Oh, you know what? Strangely enough, Oklahoma. I'd love to do Oklahoma. Wow, um, that, that's fascinating. Great, thank you. Let's dive into <laughs> questions. If that's okay. Uh, this uh, first question is from Evan Tate uh, from Portland, Oregon. Oregon. As a director choreographer, what makes you pick a story that you want to tell? Uh, and how do you want to tell that said story? First of all, Evan from Portland, hang in there, Portland. The rest of the country is with you and supports you. Um, uh, you know, I to me, it's a combination of, you know, because when you're developing a show, you spend a lot of time with those characters and with that story. And so part of it is really, when I read a script, it's like going on a first date. It's sort of like I read a script thinking, do I like these people? Do I want to be around these people and spend time with them? Because even if even if they're complicated and even if they behave badly or mess up or you know get themselves into bad situations, the feeling is do I do I care about these people? Do I empathize with them? Do I am I rooting for them? Um, and that's one of the first things is am I rooting for these characters? Do I want to spend my time with them? Thank you. Uh, this question is from Heidi Jones uh, from Miami. Uh, how has being a woman in the industry uh, influenced your career choices? Um, that's interesting, Heidi. You know, I, I was very lucky in that when I was first uh, performing, um, I got my equity card with uh, the wonderful director, Susan Shulman, uh, at Pacific Light Opera. And so uh, right from the beginning, I had a sort of, you know, a, 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 I thought there were tons of women directing musical theater. I had no idea there were so few. Um, but I think that part of it is is making sure, especially looking at 
I've done a lot of revivals. And I think mm -hmm. part of looking at revivals is you're, with a revival, you're always dealing with three time periods. You're t the time period when it was written, when it takes place, it may have been contemporary when it was written, or it might have been a period piece when it was written, and today. And I sort of feel like it's part of your responsibility, and maybe I sort of am more just super aware of this, as to you know what was funny you know, back when it was originally written might not be so funny today or what was acceptable might not be so acceptable. So I think part of it is sort of negotiating the, the, the presentation of the story in a way that's not trying to uh, ignore when it takes place or when it was written, but to make sure that it's that it makes sense and is palatable for a contemporary audience, that there aren't what I call speed bumps, that you're sort of going along and going along and all of a sudden somebody says or does something that just gives you that kind of ick factor. And I sort of feel like certainly in the uh, classic musicals that I've revisited, I think I've consistently tried to sort of look at the female point of view and the female characters and make sure that they behave in a way that is palatable and acceptable to a contemporary audience. That, that's such a great answer. Uh, with that material, I know a lot of times it's run by estates. Uh, yeah. How do those conversations happen? Uh, are estates typically open uh, to working? Does it depend on the estate? Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, first of all, it's gaining, it's gaining the trust of the people who are in, in, in charge of the, of the property mm -hmm. to know that you, you love and respect this show and you only want to make it fly for, mm -hmm. and you only may want to make it soar. You're not going to take their baby and completely redo it so it's not recognizable to them. Um, one good example is when we did Pajama Game, and Richard Adler, one of the creators, was still with us then. Uh, and, and Joy Abbott, who so sadly passed away this spring, she, she was married to Joy a uh, George Abbott, who was one of the co-writers of the book. And there, was a, there were a couple of characters. There's a character in Pajama Game, Prez, the president of the union, who was a kind of womanizing lech. Right. Who hit on all the, the girls, and they all kind of rejected him. And then finally, the only girl who didn't reject him was kind of a round girl. It's like, okay, maybe that was funny in the 1950s, right. not funny now. So with permission of the estate and Peter Ackerman, who sort of redid the book, we sort of redid those characters. Prez, instead of being a, a sort of lecherous married lech, was, um, was single, still living with his mom, and kind of like unsuccessful with women. And everybody sort of just rejected him. And the one woman who didn't reject him was the shy girl. So it still had that comic impact, but yeah. it was a sort of different dynamic that wasn't yeah. as sort of icky as that original relationship was. Oh, it's so smart, it's so smart. Uh, I have a viewer who I'd like to bring on uh, to ask you a question. Okay. Hey, Kathleen. Hi, Hi how are hey, you? Hey. I'm good. Hey, um, I'm Henry from uh, Florida State University, just gradu well, graduated. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so as you know, we're all going through these unprecedented times um, I wanted to know, have you ever faced a roadblock in your career and how did you stay mentally and physically healthy to push past that? And then similarly, what is your advice for people like me just entering the industry uh, who are facing a similar roadblock? That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times it's it's the, the roadblock is your own. Um, it's not necessarily something, something literal. Sometimes it's just your own uh, uh, belief in yourself. Mm -hmm. And sort of feeling like, am I, am I, can I take this job on? Am I capable of doing this when somebody gives you an opportunity? And for me, I sort of feel like the most important thing is to sort of have a sort of little saying that it's always for credit, which you'll understand as a recent graduate. <laughs> credit. And it doesn't matter if you're doing a reading or if you're doing a, you know, a benefit or a gala or if you're assisting somebody or you're in the ensemble or you're the dance captain, you're always for credit. And people around you will notice if you are a dedicated, you know, and focused and positive person. And so I sort of feel like sometimes the best thing to do is sort of just be very present in whatever room you're in and to give it your best in whatever room you're in, even if it's a one day reading because that will sort of pay off in terms of people recognizing um, not just your talent, but your, your dedication. Um, and I think right now, look, we're, we, we don't know when theater will come back. We know it will come back. And we know when it does, people will be hungry for it and desperate for it. It's not going anywhere. It's gonna come back as strong as ever, I believe. Um, and so I think right now, what's wonderful is seeing not only people try to keep up their skills, on in, when they're sort of isolated, right? Keeping up their physical, vocal, 
and sort of, you know, their, their, their artistic skills, mm -hmm. but also finding new ways to channel it. I'm just so impressed with these sort of, you know, Zoom readings and creative things that people are doing and choreography of, of you know, I saw the Royal Ballet and the co companies of cats doing these kind of videos in their backyards that somebody you know, puts together with technical knowledge that is so beyond me, I can't even, <laughs> but, um, but I sort of feel like, it, you know, finding a way to sort of be creative is the way to go. And even if it doesn't necessarily have the, the visibility that you want um, right now, somehow, exercising those creative muscles I think is important and will sort of keep you going and will be and so when things do open up you'll be ready you'll be ready you'll be you'll have you'll have you you'll have your gas tank will be full and you'll be ready to go absolutely thank you for that um, and I wanted to know if, if you ever faced a roadblock like this in your career well, um, like this but <laughs> yeah well you know when I first sort of I, I didn't you know I was a performer for a, a long time like most director choreographers I started off as a dancer and a performer and then I sort of started to uh, assist my brother um, my brother Rob on on several of his shows and then sort of started to get the opportunity to go off on my own which was kind of scary because I didn't know how to do that I didn't know how to put myself out there on my own and luckily I had some opportunities that came to me, but it was scary to sort of say, okay, I'm not, I'm now the one in charge as opposed to assisting somebody or working, you know, that the, there's, you know, when you're assisting or even when you're choreographing as opposed to choreographing and directing, there's kind of a shield in front of you that kind of deflects a lot of the sort of direct hits, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, response from audience or critics or producers or whatever. And then when you step out to be the director choreographer, you're sort of the, that you need those direct hits, right? And you need to deal with it. You need to sort of be able to, to listen and deal with, with all the sort of, you know, response to whatever you're putting out there, whether it's from the other writers, creative team, producers, anybody, actors. And so that was hard to sort of feel like, oh, it's, I, I'm now the responsible person who has to, I can't just sort of step back and say, not, you know, talk to, talk to that person and they'll, they'll solve the problem. Um, and so that was the first time I sort of had to do that. That was kind of, scary but um but then when you realize oh i can i can guide people through this it's very satisfying i'm sure I mean, you fared pretty well apparently <laughs> thanks henry <laughs> anyway, thank you so much thank you danny thanks. thanks good luck in florida thank you so much Oof, we need it yeah <laughs> uh, i have another guest i'd love to uh bring on if that's all right hello oh. <laughs> <laughs> i'm uh, I'm Jackson Flood from Houston, Texas. <laughs> and I want to know what it's like working on iconic revivals like Anything Goes. But more than that, like, how does that compare to, uh, you know, original movie, if you feel like that? Or I have a few other questions. <laughs> I can't believe Matthew. <laughs> Oh my God, it's so good to see you. I can't, I can't believe we didn't get to see Plaza Suite. It just breaks my heart. Yeah, me, me too. I, I know, but maybe we'll start up in uh, in again in March. We're supposed to start at the end of March. Oh, that would be great. That would be yeah. so great because we gotta we gotta honor Neil Simon. We gotta bring him back to Broadway. I could not agree more. Yeah, he's the, he's the best. He's the best. He's the best. Okay, so here's a crazy little personal thing. So your your niece and nephew, Francis and Teddy? Um, Andrew's kids? Andrew's kids. Oh, yeah. My, my wife's niece. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Your, yeah. Your wife's niece and nephew. Yeah. I guess that's right. and Montclair, our kids are friends with their kids. And we, they've all been like swimming together. Really? Yeah. Huh. Oh, that's yeah. awfully nice. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. They're, they're, they're like boy girl twins, and we've got boy girl twins. Yeah. And, they're yeah. and they all like, How nice. the yeah. So and they're allowed to, and it's swimming is all okay now. And swimming, well, it, it's like in our in our backyard, so yeah. it's like everybody feels like you know a pool's like a big vat yeah. of hand sanitizer. So it's like we'll just let them, you know, splash around, and then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man! Oh, That's it's so nice. good to see you. I was just thinking about um, nice work. Was like one of the best, yeah, fun experiences from top to bottom. I, I mean, agree. Was, that and cast was fantastic, and you and Michael McGraw and Kelly. It was just like. It was like, the and, oh, it was like, and, and Sully, and it was like, and Judy, it was like the comedy all-stars. Yeah. You know? And then mm -hmm. I leaned in and like killing it in the last two scenes. Yeah. yeah. And Matt, we're, all, we're all still friends. Can you tell us a little bit about working with Kathleen and why she is the greatest of the great? 
Well, I've worked, I've worked with her, I think twice, right? Or maybe a few reading. And we've done, we did a Neil Simon reading too. Of yeah. Rumors. Yeah. And um, I just instantly like Kathleen and relate to her humor. And we just, we like the same movies. We like, you know, old movies the same way. And uh, our sensibilities go together well. And she's a great teacher, you know, for dancing and um, and everything else with musicals, which I'm not that experienced with, her. and she's just been a great help to me. And I and I I like watching her stuff that I'm not into. I just I just <laughs> think she's great. Oh oh well, it's just I think we grew up like watching. I mean, you know, the Carol Burnett show and variety yeah. shows and then movies of like you know whether it's Marx Brothers or whatever. It's just that yeah. humor. You just can't I, that that kind of you know just fast paced yeah. humor is yeah. just the best. We've got the same the references best. and yeah. I know that's what my husband always says to me when I'm making a reference. He says, could you make a reference from the 21st century perhaps? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of my, my kids recently asked me, why do you always watch gray movies? <laughs> 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 Although we did, we got our kids to watch Some Like It Hot and they loved it. Oh, well, yeah, occasionally you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's so great. Other movies and they, they love them. Yeah. I only but watch it's... movies where everybody in it is dead. <laughs> <laughs> For a long time. I remember you and McGraw doing the like, start every word with, and every sentence with say and end it with C. <laughs> hey, where are you guys going? See? Say, yeah, we gotta get those guys out of here. See, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much for being here. I so thank appreciate you. it. And, and awesome. wherever you are, Kathleen, um, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Oh my god, what a, what a, what a great surprise! <laughs> yeah, I just got everything. <laughs> oh my god, he's the best. He's the yeah, best. Yeah, I, I loved every second of nice work. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just so smart and so funny. You just laughed the entire time. It was just oh, it was, fantastic. It was, it was, like I said, it was the comedy all-stars. They were just brilliant. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. This next question is from Diego Cortez from Mexico City. I'm from Mexico City. I'm a director choreographer in my hometown. Uh, you are my favorite director choreographer in the world. Oh. Uh, I want to know some advice for foreign directors choreographers who want to be observers or assistants in rehearsal periods of Broadway shows. Diego, that's I'm just so flattered. That's lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, there's something called SDC, which is the Stage Dire Directors and Choreographers Union, has a foundation, the SDCF, Stage Directors and Choreographers Foundation. And they have a wonderful, wonderful program called the Observership Program. Mm -hmm. And you have to apply, and you have to sort of, uh, you know, fill out as the, some information, and you have to apply to this program. And what they do is all year round, they place young directors and choreographers with, uh, with different shows and different directors and choreographers on Broadway, off-Broadway, regionally, all over the United States. Um, so that you can observe, and um, and I I think of almost every show I've done, I've had an SDC observer, um, because there's nothing like being in the room. I always say it's like a foreign language, and um, you know, and, and you, you may learn a foreign language in school, but it's not till you actually go to the country and have to actually speak it out loud mm. that you really learn the language. So I think you know, being in a room and and watching other directors and choreographers work, how they you know their whole process is so so valuable, and I think. Um, if you can, you know, I don't know, I mean, travel is uh, all up in the air right now, but the SDC uh, F Observership Program is really, really awesome. And it's a great way to sort of get in the door and, and see what's happening. And you've had some assistant associates that have gone on to tremendous yeah. projects. Yeah. Well, um, it, you know, I always say, it's, you know, directing and choreography is like an apprenticeship business, especially choreography. I mean, I assisted my brother. He assisted Graciela Danielle. Graciela mm -hmm. assisted Bob Fosse. Bob Fosse was supervised on his first show by Jerome Robbins. Um, Rob Ashford, who's a great pal of mine and roommates when we first moved to New York, he assisted me on Kiss Me Kate. Um, my observer on Susical was Dan Connectis, who's now uh, running the, you yeah. know, it's, uh, yeah. No, it's the, yeah. And, and so, um, you know, so it's, it's a small world ultimately. Yeah. I wow. I, I, I can't believe you were roommates with Rob. That's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh. Yeah. We, we, I, I was born in Madison, but grew up in Pittsburgh. He went to Point Park College. We met sort of doing things around Pittsburgh and performed at Civic Light Opera together in the summers and then and moved to New York together. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I have another viewer I'd love to bring on to ask you a question. Okay. Hello. Chris, how are you? I'm so well. How are you? Oh my gosh, Sheena, it's so good to see you, honey. You too, you too. Sheena, did you used to live with Derek C? Um, I did for a brief time, yes. Yeah, I, I I'm his ex-boyfriend. I remember being in your apartment. Oh, <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, I don't a surprise. <laughs> how oh, are you? Oh, uh, we were Sheena and I were in the middle. We were doing a show that got interrupted. We had the yeah. six Brown off Broadway, transport court. But luckily we got to open. I mean, given yeah. the times we're in, we actually got to open, but we were sort of just halfway through our run. And then that was that. Oh, well, I hope it comes back at some point. I know, yeah. I, hope. I hope. I'm trying to think, Sheena, the first time, was bells are ringing? Yes. Time? Another? Yes. That was at Encores, and yeah. then we went right from Bells with with Kelly, and right. um, and Will Chase, and then we went we ran into right into Anything Goes, like yeah. right from that. Yeah, yeah. Gina was one of our angels. I forget which angel you were. I think it was Charity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Sheena, um, you worked with Kathleen on so many projects. Can you uh, talk a little bit about working with her and why she is so fantastic? Yes, I mean dreams. Uh, when when you get to work with Kathleen Marshall, when she calls, you you say yes and drop everything. Um, just been so fortunate to work with you. Um, you know, I think everyone that's worked with her is a huge fan. She's just so kind, so thoughtful, so the most prepared you could ever be. And then, if anything, and always has the ability to also, you know. Um, uh, let us change course if we need to and still be prepared literally for anything. So um, just always, always have the best to, to work with you, yes. Um, you feel so safe uh, and you can still, and safe enough to try new things. And then I'll never forget, you'd be like, no, nope, thanks, thanks, thanks for trying, thanks for trying. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work, we're just gonna, you know. <laughs> yeah, but no. she is the best and um, no. knows when, you know, knows how to smartly use her her cast, so they, they can keep a run safely, um, and <laughs> the highest and the best. She her standards are so high. Oh, <laughs> thank you, it's so kind. Yeah, how many Broadway shows have you done? Like 800? eight hundred? Eight. Eight. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Amazing. You know, she was just in um, in Tootsie. Yeah. And um, we were preparing on Singapore Molly Brown, and it was like, well, you know, all these people aren't available. They aren't available, and I feel like a like a like a pariah. Because like as soon as as soon as it was in house, and which I loved Tootsie, I loved it, I adored it, and we were all so shocked. It was like, oh my gosh, they're closing, and I got to come home. Yes, I was like, I'm gonna. It out perfectly. Just the next day, I started. Wow. Yeah. That's unbelievable. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good to see you, honey. You too. Oh you gosh. have a question for Kathleen? I do. Um, Benjamin Toy from Chicago, Illinois, wants to know. What do you look for in your dancers at auditions and what makes you rehire the dancers? Um, well, you know, it, it's interesting, of course, with musical theater, there's a certain skill level, right? Acting's a little more sort of amorphous, right? But with musical theater, it's like there's a skill level in terms of your dance ability and your singing ability. So there's a threshold you kind of have to meet. But for me, it's also, it's so much more about the individual. Um, it's so much more about people who are vivid, who are interesting, who sort of take the choreography that they're given and somehow make it their own, make it look like it's coming from them. And I think a lot of times people treat an audition like a sort of Olympic event. You know, they're trying to just get through it and not get any, you know, any deep, you know, uh, points taken off, you know, like, like you would if you were skating, like, oh, they didn't stick that landing, that's minus five points or, oh, you know. And I sort of feel like in an audition, it, who cares if you fell out of your pirouette? I don't care. Uh, you know, what? I want to see sort of something really individual and very vivid. And for me, the reason, one of the reasons why I love working with Sheena every time I work with her is because she's so positive. I mean, besides being immensely talented and gorgeous and can do anything. And she's a dancer who is like also has a soprano voice, which is like 
a rare, rare thing, She's like a unicorn in theater. <laughs> um, yeah. but, uh, but it's it's also it's it's somebody who's creative, who's positive, who comes in the room every day, sort of ready to play, and who and and just that energy. And I sort of feel like you know we we have there's enough negative energy we have to deal with the rest of our world and the rest of our lives. And certainly the, the rehearsal room and the theater should not be a place of negativity. It should be a place of challenge and sort of wanting to always make it better. But I sort of just love people who are who are who want to create a community. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> so nice to see your face. I know, honey. I can't wait for you know the good news is when this is all over, we're gonna get into the studio and make an album of it. Yes, yes, now. yes. So we have this little light at the end of the tunnel that we know we're all gonna be together again. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay. Sheena, it's so nice to see you again. Thank you so nice much. Thank you. Um, Have a good thanks. Take care. Bye. <laughs> I mean, this is like this is your life, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> Which is another reference from the 20th century, from the 50s, that people in you know 2020 will have no idea what it is. Yeah, right. Um, if you if you haven't seen Sheena's dancing through my resume, you all need to watch it. Uh, it is it is so tremendous. Uh, it's it's really just really <laughs> feat in and of itself. Uh, this next question uh, is from Bill Murphy uh, from our social media channels. What was it like to direct and choreograph the Grease revival? Oh, that was wild because that was connected with the TV show, You're the One That I Want, right. you know, where we sort of, it was a, a sort of, uh, you know, talent competition show to find the Danny and the Sandy. And right. we found the beautiful Laura Osmus and the fantastic Max Crumb. Right. That, she, yeah. that was her first That's thing. Laura's Broadway debut. Yeah. Oh my God. Wow. So, uh, she was, they were great. They were so much fun. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what was fun about that is that I, I love Greece and I've seen all the you know, productions of it and of course the movie. And what was great about our Broadway production was one of the first times that they allowed all the songs that had been added from the mo for the movie to be put into the stage production. So the title mm -hmm. number, Hopelessly Devoted to You, right. What I Want, um, Sandy, as opposed to Alone at the Drive-In. So that was really, it was fun because it was like, okay, this is trying to combine the stage production of Grease that people know and love with the movie that they know and love and right. sort of kind of meld them together into one. Um, but it was really fun. And 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 the great thing is, is that because of the TV show, we brought, we brought an audience in that maybe didn't necessarily come to New York and see Broadway all the time. There was a family I remember once, we were in previews, and they were all at the back of the house and they were all dressed up. The little boys were like in jackets and ties and like all. <laughs> and uh, I can't remember where they were from. And they said they were gonna take their family vacation to Hawaii but the boys wanted had seen the TV show. You're the one that I want. <laughs> and they took their family vacation to New York to come see Greece. And I said, "Well, will you come back and see more Broadway shows?" And they said, "Yes." And I was like, "Yeah, all right, great." And isn't that isn't that tremendous? Yeah. You know, yeah. like it, it. Sometimes I think it's hard for for us who are you know from the stage world and so in the yeah. stage world to loosen up and, and work in television or allow some type of TV contest. But when it brings different audiences in that now will cherish and champion and support the theater, yeah. how, how exciting is that? Yeah, it was great. I said, it was, this is this is totally worth it. This, I'm glad we did this. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I have another guest I'd like to bring on to ask you a question. Uh-oh. <laughs> Please. Oh, hey, God. How are you? How are you? So good to see you, honey. You too. It's been a while. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. How are you? Where's, how, where's your beautiful daughter? She's uh, coming to pick me up in a couple <laughs> minutes to run an errand with her. I'm in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. Oh yeah? Yeah, we came out here to help her open a new business and then we just stayed. We came out yeah. in February and you know, all the Michigan started and we're here. Oh wow. And so Connie's here too? Connie's here too. We oh, have great. a little house here. Oh, that's fantastic. Ohio, so Perry's coming over. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's great. Please give them, please give my lovely ladies your, my, uh, my love. How old are your kids now? They just turned 10. Oh, I don't think I've seen them since they were three. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll get on to business. It's so good. <laughs> right. I, what do you think? We first, was Kiss Me Kate the first time we worked together? No. no. Uh, she loves me. Were you assisting? Yes. Rob? Yes. I assisted Rob. That's no. right. Yeah, that that's right. Good. And Steve Post, the best. 92, 80, 92. 
92. Almost yeah. 30 years. Yeah. Oh, and Boy Game. Yeah. Oh, that was such a great production. I love that cast so, so much. Mm -hmm. But of course, I was a fan of yours because of Little Shop of Horrors, of course, and played and wore out that cassette tape. I'm sad to say it was cassette tape. Yeah, I did. Uh, listen to that cast album until I broke the cassette tape. Yeah, and then we did it. We did yeah. it again. Yeah. In Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love That's that. the last thing we did. Yeah. Did you see the revival of Little Shop? Did you go see it? I went to the Off Broadway one. Yeah, the Off Broadway when, revival. Uh, when not when not when Jonathan was on. Uh, uh -huh. I can't think of his name. Uh, 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 he went on. I wanted to see him do it. Uh, I forget. And then he was going to take over. Mm -hmm. I hope he's not watching. Uh, <laughs> did you do the one in Miami? I did the one in Miami. I did it at the Kennedy Center two years ago. Right. With Nick, with Nick Cordero. I oh. was a dentist. Oh. oh, wow. Oh, wow. Did you, did you have something to do with Florida? I, I was an usher uh, for oh, the, really? entire, the entire really? run of Little Shop when, I was, when I was growing up in Miami. It was an interesting production. Yeah. <laughs> to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. It's so good to see you. Oh, my gosh. I have a question. Oh, okay. From Ashley Abrams. I have one from her and then one from me. Ashley Abrams from Portland, Oregon wants to know, what is the first thing you ever remember choreographing that you were proud of. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, you know, I actually choreographed something in my high school. Um, I was in choir in high school, and there was we and we had a choir teacher who sort of liked doing all kinds of music, and she did like us. We were doing I can't remember a song. It was something that was swing, and there was another guy in the choir who I knew was could kind of dance and partner, and we in the middle of this choir number like stepped out and did like a jitterbug. And like did lifts and all kinds of stuff, and then like stepped back into the choir and sang the rest of the song. And I think that was the first thing I choreographed on my own. And so you know, and I, and I think we just we asked. I think we even asked if we could do it. So you we were, we were bold. <laughs> but oh, Kaplan and me. We You're my favorite there. choreographer that I've ever worked oh. with. <laughs> I, 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 by I, far, by um, far. That's not my brother. I loved him too. <laughs> I loved him. <laughs> Kiss Me Kate was such, that was the most joyous experience from beginning to end. That that cast and you and Michael. It was, it was sublime. And you and Michael uh, Blakemore and Michael Mulherin are responsible for my performance. Everything, <laughs> particularly you and Michael Blakemore. Uh -huh. you, you, because you knew how I work. I, mean, yes. I don't know if you remember the first day of uh, 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 dance rehearsal, I was crying. Yeah, I, that's, I, that's my process. It's like, <laughs> I'm gonna get. I mean, you I, knew what I could do. You knew, you, you know, that you built that around that. And the number was, I have to say, I never saw it, but I know that it was brilliant. And, um, but you and Michael Blakemore handed me my performances. I just did what you guys told me to do. Thank God I could pull off, but we, I didn't have any ideas. It was all you guys, Lee do this, Lee do this, line reading from Michael Blakemore, which I don't have any problem with. And <laughs> because of you, I, I was okay in it. You were brilliant. No, you were brilliant. That and number I, I, was so much fun to do. <laughs> I remember we were started working on Brush Up Your Shakespeare. We worked on it for like an hour and we took a break. We were down at 890. And I was like sitting in the stage manager's office and all of a sudden I look up and Lee's standing in the door and he's like, you're gonna replace me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I was like, we're an hour. You were patient for me. One hour. First, <laughs> I, I go into a very dark place the first day of Corey. And, and, and I'll tell you a story. I was crying. And I went to that same day later in the afternoon, Barbara Matera's. Oh yeah. Admitted. And Michael Moharan had been there before me and she said, I hear you're having a hard time with the choreography. <laughs> Who the hell told you that? <laughs> Your partner. So I went to him the next day. I said, let's let's keep it at the rehearsal. <laughs> Don't tell people that I cry. Well, I always say that okay. Yeah. And I remember the first time we ran it in front of the cast. 
and yeah. and they really liked it, and that was all I needed for my yeah. confidence to really be there. That that, that people yeah. acknowledged it. Well, I always say with choreography, it's there's no way to prepare for it. You can you know you can look at your script, you can look at your music, you can go in for your scene with you know with some sense of what's going to happen in the scene and how you're you know you can prepare. There's no way to prepare for choreography. There's nothing to do but walk in the room and wait till the choreographer says okay, step forward on your right foot. And so, you know, there's it's the most you know agonizing and terrifying thing for so many people because it's, there's you can't prepare for it. And then when you go home at night. You can't rehearse it because you have nothing, you know, now maybe we sort of do like little videos on people's phones. But I would rehearse it in my head. Yeah. I wouldn't rehearse it like really doing it, but I would go <laughs> anyhow. I'm sure there's other people that want to ask questions. I love you, Kathleen. Oh, I love you, Lee. And thanks, Danny. <laughs> and okay. uh, of course, they say so much. Patty and Perry. Thank you, everybody. Wear your masks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Love you. Bye. <laughs> <Just Bye. say>. <laughs> <laughs> He's so sweet. Oh my so God, he's funny. The he's the best. <laughs> yeah. um, that, that's a perfect segue to my next question. Uh, for those of us who are a little dancing, uh, uh, how do I say this? Those of us who are strong movers, uh, <laughs> you know, walking into a room, I think there's a lot of intimidation. You know, we get nervous walking in. We want to make sure uh, that we're doing our best. Uh, but a lot of times we just completely forget. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's hard. Uh, yeah. What is a skill that you think uh, can help us? What should we be working on to be better in the room? Look, yeah, you know, a dance audition is a terrifying thing for so many people. Because like I said, you can't prepare for it, right? You just have to walk in. And, and, and I don't think dance auditions should be a memorization test. That's what rehearsal is for, right? You know, people come in with, even with their sides memorized. It's like, I don't, you don't have to memorize this scene to, to sort of make an impression. You just have to live the scene and be mm. present in it. And so um, that's the way my way feel of choreography. Um, I actually, when people mess up, I kind of don't mind because a lot of times when people mess up, their kind of true persona comes out, you know, whether they laugh it off or they get mad at themselves or they get flustered. And so I sort of don't mind if people mess up. And quite honestly, you know, depending on what we're doing, um, you know, you can tell with a couple of counts of eight if somebody has this sort of coordination that you can get, get that they can learn the choreography you want them to learn. And so if you mess up a little section, but I see then the other sections that you kind of got it, it's okay. It's all right. I can sort of see that you that, that you can do it. And I think that's the thing is to, is to sort of just try as much as you can to not show your anxiety and to, and, and I always say when, with choreography, remember when you watch somebody dance, you watch their face. You don't look at their feet. You don't look at their hands or their shoulders. Even when you're watching Fred Astaire, you're watching his face. You're taking in the whole body, but you're watching his face. And so to feel like, try to put all the anxiety and the you know nervousness back here, so that up here, you can at least have something sort of positive and, I mean, depending on what the choreography is, right? You could be asking the choreography that's yeah. angry or intense or, or, you know, have some other emotion to it. But at least yeah. allow whatever emotion in the choreography is to sort of come out on your face. You know, that's, that's so helpful. I, um, I, the, the last big show I did was a uh, sister act and Janet Rothermel was, uh, Anthony's associate. Uh, mm -hmm. and I remember auditioning and being scared out of my mind, um, <laughs> because I wasn't a dancer. And I remember she pulled me over, uh, and she said, you know, if you mess up, just keep on going because if you mess up in the show, we want to know that you'll just keep on going. Mm. And it gave me permission to just, go and just yeah. do it and not worry about consequences. And yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's the best answer you can give. <laughs> right. uh, I have another viewer I'd love to bring on if that's all right. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Hi. Cecilia. I just graduated with a BFA in musical theater from Otterbein University, and I'm from Chicago. Um, and I have congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It was an interesting semester. Um, <laughs> so my question is, when you are behind the table at a dance call, uh, for example, an anything goes dance call, what specific qualities in the dancers you end up casting stick out to you when you're behind the table? Mm -hmm. And how do these qualities vary based on the show that you're casting? Um, question. I mean, I think that's also part of your job as a director and choreographer is to know, is to serve the show, right? So there are a lot of times when there are, 
incredibly talented people come in, you know, who, who you love, but you have to decide what's the what's the the, the sort of style and the and, and the sort of you know what, what's the what does this show require that may make it unique from other shows. Um, certainly, with anything goes, you know, the fact that there's a big tap dance number in it was sort of, you know, because there are some dancers that I knew and love and I was like, you tap, you're not tap. And some of them did and some of them didn't. And we had to go through that whole process. Um, but anything goes sort of acts like a classic farce, you know, which is that you take a group of people and you put them sort of in one location over a short period of time where everything's sort of, you know, going wrong and mistaken identities and people who are, you know, want something to happen, desperately want something to happen, desperately want something else to happen. But also it was a very sort of the idea is I wanted to be have a sort of you know sensuality to it as well. So the fact that you have sort of you know sailors and passengers and you know these angels. So besides seeing um, wanting a um, wanting this to look like a, a group of passengers from all walks of life, right? You want it to look like a sort of group of people as opposed to some shows that are kind of homogenous, right? There's some shows where it's like the 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 ensemble acts like a unit. You know, they're sort of um, 42nd Street. Yeah. They're, just, they're dancers in a show. This I wanted to look like a diverse group of people who all sort of meet together on this on this shift. But I wanted everybody to have a sort of energy and to have a sort of sensual energy to them, no matter who they were, because I think that's part of the farce is that everybody's sort of, you know, everybody's kind of wanting this experience to be unlike any other experience they've ever had. So people who sort of have that really forward energy as opposed to being laid back. So that was something specifically for that show to have this, that something sort of crackling under underneath. Um, and I think that um, you said, you know, for, for people who can sort of find the style of the movement you're doing, because I think a lot of times in dance auditions, people focus on the, the technique. Like I nailed the triple pirouette. I did the six o'clock kick. My, you know, jeté was, you know, 180 degrees. And, and they forget that you're also looking for style, right? And sort of, and for also, for your own personality. It's like, if you can do that six o'clock kick and make it look like I did that because I want to, mm -hmm. and I have some reason for doing it, as opposed to because the choreographer told me to do it. That's the kind of thing I love in a dancer. Somebody who sort of very quickly takes the choreography they're given and puts it in their own body in a way that makes it look like this is how I move and this is how I express myself, as opposed to I'm just sort of doing this, doing what somebody told me to do. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, Danny. Sure. Of course. <laughs> uh, Kathleen, uh, you you and your brother are, are powerhouses. Uh, it, it is unbelievable that you come from the same family, but probably not so unbelievable. What was your background? What was your training like? Uh, how did your parents produce uh, two unbelievable uh, <laughs> choreographers? Um, well, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was a really great, my parents both taught at the University of Pittsburgh. So they're mm. educators and academics. Um, but they, uh, and my mother was in um, uh, public school administration before that. So she sort of was, knew, knew the city better than anybody because she worked in every school in the, in the city. Um, and the thing is they were, they are, they were and still are great um, absorbers of culture. And <laughs> everything. So before we ever took a lesson or did anything else, they took us to museums, to sporting events, to opera, to ballet, to symphony, to Shakespeare, to musical theater. They just, we, we saw everything we could possibly see in Pittsburgh. And so we were fans. My brother Rob, my sister Mara, my brother Rob and Mara are twins. My sister Mara is in uh, uh, Alexandria, Virginia. She has her own design and build, uh, interior design, art uh, and landscape design and Unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> has her own business. Wow. Uh, and um, and so I think, you know, we were fans of theater before we even thought we could participate in, in, in any way. And I think that's, you know, that's such a great thing is that something you just love, you know, it's like it's like a sports fan who then finds out, oh, I can actually play this sport. I can't just, you know, I, I don't have to just watch baseball. I can actually participate in it. Oh, and, and, and it fits me. And I think that's what it felt like when I first started taking dance lessons. I didn't take dance till I was 13 years old. I started kind of late, but it was like kids who sort of pick up a guitar and go, I know how to do this, or who pick up a paintbrush and go, yeah, this makes sense to me. It sort of just, it just made sense to me. It just fit me when I started it. 
Wow, I love that thought of being a fan of the arts first and then jumping in. Maybe those two boys from the Grease revival in the suits yeah. will end up being the next big direct <laughs> choreographers, next Kathleen Marshalls. That would be great. Um, <laughs> this question is from Long Island, uh, from Doug Gallo. Do you have any tips on navigating tech rehearsals on the incredible, incredible musicals you've worked on with so many moving pieces? Um, as a director, is he saying, I think, or a uh, performer? Yeah, yeah, I, I think, you know, tech is, is a really challenging time. Uh, so with so much going on and so many moving things, uh, how do you yeah. navigate it as a director? I know everyone has their own process. Well, it's it's like what they say about movie making, um, which is like, how do you how do you eat a car? And the answer is one bite at a time, right? Um, because it's going to take a while to get there, right? right? And especially depending on how technically complicated the show is. And I sort of feel like you know the 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 first thing is to sort of make sure that as you're working through the show that the actors are comfortable in the space because they have to own the space, right? They mm -hmm. have to sort of feel like this is their world and their whatever, whether it's fourth wall or stylized or whatever the, whatever the style of the show is, to sort of feel like this is the world they're inhabiting. Right. And I think it's also, you know, it's, it's sort of like being a quarterback leading your team down the field. You've got to make sure that, that everybody's ready to move forward. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's, okay, it's going to take a little more time to get this light too right or the sound too right, or we've got to go back because that costume change didn't happen and we have to figure that out. It's sort of feeling... I think you have to feel that everybody is confident enough to, to move on. And a lot of times we know just by the repetition of it, yes, the first time through is going to be rough and the second time through will be better and the third time through will be better. And so one of the things I do in tech is that uh, depending on if it, how, you know, how long your tech is, I try to keep having the time. So like the first time through, it may take us four days to get to the show once with, with you know, all the elements, with lights, with sound, with text, with props. Sometimes you have costumes right away, sometimes you wait in that costume. Then I sort of feel like, okay, the next time let's try to get through the show in two days. Act one, day one, act two, day two. And then the next time let's try to get through the show in one day, act one in the afternoon, act two in the evening. So we sort of keep compressing the time, um, knowing that eventually we're going to get to a nonstop run through, where hopefully all the elements are in place. But I think it's also, it's just making sure that that as you move forward, that all the departments are ready to move forward because nobody wants to be left in the dust and feel like they didn't have the time to really, you know, really solidify what their department is, and that they have to sort of play catch up the next time around. Because that that just makes people agitated and 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 you know and, and uncomfortable. They sort of feel like it's most important when they feel that everybody's ready to move on. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Neil Schleifer um, from Bronxville. Uh, in Transit was a charming, intimate musical. Small cast, unit set, no orchestra. Uh, I wish it had run forever. Do you have any say in the final decision of when shows are pulled? No, I mean, it's, I thank you for that. I loved In Transit. It was, it was one of my favorite shows to work on. It was challenging because it was all a cappella. As you said, no orchestra. Everybody had earwigs in and are singing, you know, they were literally singing back up as they're changing clothes backstage or walking backstage to get to another entrance. It was Circle um, in the Square too, right? Circle in the Square, right. It's so you had- fascinating people, space too. Yeah, people walking under the seats singing, you know, do, 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 back up. <laughs> walking around to their next, en next entrance. It was, it was wild. Wow. And doing hand signals with the dressers because they couldn't, because they're singing and at the same time they're mm -hmm. changing, it's wild. Um, but you know, I think we we opened in the fall. It was actually crazy. We actually had our we had off election day. This is 2016. We were off on election day, and our invited dress was the next day. Mm. So, like most of us, we were sort of walking around, kind of numb and in shock. Yeah. And then we sort of kind of pulled it together, and we said, you know, in transit is a musical about what to do when you're stuck, mm. how to move forward when you're at a place in life when you don't know how to move forward, when you don't see there's a, a way forward. Mm -hmm. And so we said, maybe this is exactly the musical we should be doing right now, showing people that you can be stuck in life and still find a way to break through. Mm -hmm. uh, and we ran into the spring of that year. Um, I can't remember, it, you know, it ended up being a kind of crowded spring. And that sort of happens sometimes with shows when it's where if you don't, you know, for some reason gain enough momentum, and the thing is, the second floor was a small theater, so it was the kind of thing that we were we were selling out on the weekends. But the problem is, you can only sell so many tickets on the weekends, and the right. bigger theaters 
if you sell out on the weekends, it can carry you through the maybe Tuesday, Wednesday that's not so crowded, and then you get these big crowds on the weekends. And with a smaller theater like that, there's sort of no way to make up for that, you know, if you don't have the full houses throughout the week. Right. So that was one of our issues being in a smaller theater. And I think the spring of that year just became kind of crowded season, and and all of a sudden people have lots of other choices. Um, and so it's it's always you know a you, you know a decision of the producers and uh, and the the theater owners in you know in, in in combination with each other deciding you know when it's time for a for a show to end. But then it's always sad. But then something new comes in, right? It's sort of like you know it's a rebirth. Yes, yeah. else comes in. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a circle of theater, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about your rehearsal process, uh, your pre-production process, what that looks like? Um, I love to do a lot of research. Um, I love to do, uh, depending on the, what the show is, um, if it's a period show, researching movement, mu music, you know, fashion, uh, history from that era. So you kind of really know that, you know, I always say in theater, you become a temporary expert in something, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, what I Way way back when I choreographed seventy seventy six, I was a temporary expert in the you know Continental Congress, and right. uh, <laughs> uh, and so you know you, you sort of I, I like to do a lot of research about that uh, about the era. Um, I used to go to you know uh, Lincoln Center Library and look at you know uh, films and yeah. uh, dancing or Charleston or whatever it was. Now of course so much on YouTube, it's so wild. Yeah. Um, or I'd go to what's now called the Paley Center, the Museum of Television and Broadcasting, to sort of look at what research they had from, I remember when doing Grease, going to look at old episodes of, of you know, Hullabaloo and American Bandstand from the 50s. Because I think um, it's always interesting to sort of look at what the social dancing of an era was, and then seeing how you can expand the social dancing into something more theatrical on the stage. Yeah, you said Lincoln, Lincoln Center Library. Lincoln Center Performing Arts Library, and the Paley Center, which is on, I think it's like on 53rd or 54th Street. It's it's uh, the Museum of Television and Radio Broadcasting, and they have everything ever, yeah, like for instance, they had, Rosalind Russell did a, a like a, a version of Wonderful Town on television, and Ethel Merman did a version of Anything Goes with Burt Lahr and Frank Sinatra that was on television, and they have those there, and you can go see them. Wow, there. what a great resource. So, yeah, yes, yeah, fantastic. Um, and and then I sort of feel like it's really ah, right there. There we go. Oh yeah, reading the reading the script and reading it. You know, I always feel with shows, it's like to me, it's like it's like a a spiral. You sort of you go around and around, and eventually you kind of work your way to the center. But it, mm. I think it takes a long time to do that. You know, it takes a right. it takes a while of sort of rereading the script, doing the research, listening to the music again. You know, sort of zeroing in slowly but surely. Thank you very much. Uh, let's find another really great question. Okay, this is from BJ Apple. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, more about how you select dancers uh, for pre-production? Well, usually in pre-production, it's usually just me and whoever my associate choreographer is, David Eggers I've worked with a lot, Vince Pesh, Carolee Meadows. Usually it's just us and maybe the dance captain, depending on what the show is. Okay. Um, uh, I don't necessarily bring in a bunch of dancers because uh, I sort of feel like usually in pre-production I'm kind of figuring out vocabulary and um, and sort of the, the shape of the number as a whole right. and not really filling in all the details till we have the full company. Right. Um, but um, but certainly I remember with Pajama Game working on Steam Heat, David Eggers and Vince Pesh were both there who had, and were both in the show as well because I said, well, there's no way to really work on an iconic trio like this without a trio of people. You know, so we sort of uh, did that. Um, but I, I don't necessarily bring in a whole whole team full of dancers because I um, I still feel like that's um, until until I have a sense of what the number's about, you know, and where what the story of it is, what the arc of it is. I'd rather just work with a small group of people, and then we film ourselves. Thank you. We we do the you know we get the now it's the iPhone it used to be the video, right. thing. and we always right. film ourselves from behind looking in the mirror. So that when you go back to look at it, it's the way you learn dance, right? You stand behind the teacher who's facing the mirror. Mm -hmm. So we always film ourselves like that. So when we go back to look at it, we're not trying to flip and reverse it. Mm, thank you. Uh, this question is from a YouTube user named John Axel. Uh, it's to the second. Uh, what was your most stressful moment as a choreographer? 
Oh gosh, stressful moment as a choreographer. Um, no, no, I think, you know, I, I do remember my first, the first Broadway show I ever choreographed was Swing on a Star. Um, it was a little review that started at the Grocery Playhouse, went to Good Speed Opera House, and then came into New York. And uh, it only lasted about three or four months. Um, but it was, I ended up getting a Drama Desk nomination, and it was sort of, you know, I got I got into the club <laughs> with that show. I'd already assisted my brother on several Broadway shows, but this was my first sort of solo outing. And I remember coming home, you know, walking out, we were at the uh, Music Box Theater, and I remember coming out of the stage shore once and sort of looking at all the marquees on 45th Street here, and sort of just having this moment of terror, which is that, oh my gosh, this is so, uh, this is, I'm, I'm, this is, this is going to be so exposed, right? I mean, it's like we had, we had done the same show successfully at these regional theaters, but the thought of now we're on 45th Street was sort of just a little terrifying. Mm -hmm. And then you have to sort of just forget about it and go back in the stage door and say, we're doing the same thing we did, you know, at George Street or at uh, Good Speed, or it's the same thing you do in your high school or your college or your backyard. It's the same process. And you have to sort of put your head down and sort of say, let's make the best show we can mm -hmm. and not worry what street we're on <laughs> because mm -hmm. that can sort of be, you know, sort of overwhelming sometimes. This is my last question for you. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, my question is, how are you staying creative during this time and are you still uh, working on projects? Yeah, well, we had two, I had, was supposed to be doing two readings, one in March, one in April that were postponed. And we're in the process of trying to figure out how we can maybe do a virtual reading of them, mm. which is complicated with musicals, as you know, the, the Zoom doesn't really work with live music, you know, and multiple. It's so hard. Yeah. hard. So we're trying to figure out how we can um, perhaps sort of continue the development of those shows. And there's two other shows I'm working on that we're also in development with. And then what I'm, what is in the back of my head is thinking that, you know, we don't know what theater is going to come fully back, right, in terms of fully staged shows. But I think what can come back first is something like cabaret or concerts. Mm -hmm. And so in the back of my head, I'm thinking, well, where can we possibly do a concert version of some of these shows that we're working on? Just yes. for several reasons, to get it out there, to get an audience response, for, for uh, us to continue to work on these shows. Uh, and to get out of the house and, and just yeah. watch something. You yeah. know, just and I think like, <laughs> like audiences would be interested in that too. And it's like, yes. okay, well, even if we're sitting in a half empty theater and the, and it's and, and it's actually something interesting because we as, as theater uh, professionals, we go to these 29 hour readings all the time, right? right? We see multiple, you know, ones a week of people standing at music stands and, and somebody reading stage directions and, and, you know, the band over there. And I sort of feel like, but for a general audience, they don't get to see that process. Right. And that would be sort of something really kind of interesting and new for an audience to see a musical in development and then hopefully down the line see the whole incarnation of it and see how it how it got to that. I love that. Then they're, they're supporting it from the beginning. You know, they feel yeah. like they are a part of it in a way. I mean, I, I love that. Yeah. Smart. So hoping, hoping. <laughs> well, I mean, it is such a pleasure to chat with you today. I so look forward to when you next teach at the Growing Studio. I know. Um, I feel like we're back in person. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and I'm going to send you a message about the kids because I'm going to need a lot of help. Okay. okay. <laughs> when do we do, October? Uh, November, November, November 16th. Okay, we'll talk. All right, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see you. All right, thanks, Danny. Thanks, bye. Bye. <laughs> Uh, I'm Danny Boyd.